Okay, so we are continuing with the aid to electronic banking stroke, digital banking or electronic delivery channels. Now, last week we looked at ATM and we saw how ATM banking takes place and everything that there is to know about ATM. Today, we are going to look at electronic cards. Electronic cards too happens to be one of the important channels or aids to electronic banking. All right, now, Please, as soon as you join the um, virtual platform, mute yourself so that we don't have feedbacks from your background. All right, so basically, as I was saying, there are two main electronic cards, two main electronic cards. That is the credit cards and the debit cards the credit cards and the debit card. Now, electronic cards, when we talk about electronic cards, what we mean by electronic cards is the fact that electronic cards are small plastic, you know, small plastic um, cards which aid with electronic payments small plastic cards which aid in electronic payments. Now, anything about electronic payments or when you are making payments online or when you go for shopping and you are making payments via your card or you, know, you want to make payments without physical cash, you can use your electronic card to make payments, whether the electronic card is credit card or debit card. This evening, we will look at the two main electronic cards, the various types of these cards, and how electronic cards work in general. Now, the lecture is, this is a very long lecture, so I don't know, it's, it's very long, but then um, some of the things are uh, things we can just run through because you are familiar with some of these things we are going to be discussing about this evening. Now, normally what I do is that I, I normally start credit card, we begin with credit cards anyway, but I normally start with a video, a video or a movie. I normally make the class watch um, five minutes of this movie called Confessions of the Shopaholic. And after that, we start. But um, I, this time I'm, I'm not going to do that. I would rather urge you to look for the movie Confessions of a Shopaholic, and then watch in your own spare time. It's a movie which gives much education on credit cards. When you watch in your own spare time, you will learn a lot about credit cards. But then as I move on, I may be telling you some parts I mean, I'll be telling you, you know, um, or I'll be making reference to the movie by telling you some of the things that happened that relates to what we are going to talk about. So please look for this movie, Confessions of a Shopaholic, or if you don't have it, next week, God willing, if we meet, if we meet on Wednesday evening, you can come with a fresh, pen drive 
all the people I have taught know me that I don't accept used pen drives. If you want me to give you the movie, I'll, I will only give it to the class can contribute and buy a pen drive and give it to the class captain. The pen drive, when you buy it, you don't open it in my absence. You need to bring it the tear rubber. You open the pen drive in my presence. I have to see that it is new. I have to, in fact, very Hello, fact madam. that it is new. I don't accept pen drives in my machine because, not only because of viruses, but because of something I have learned during my experience as e-banking lecturer. You know, people actually program pen drive and then they use it to steal information from your laptops. So when you accept somebody's pen drive, you slot it into your machine. The pen, the, immediately the scanning sign will come. As if um, you might think that um, maybe your machine is scanning the pen drive for viruses and then erase them. But it will be the pen drive scanning your machine for your sensitive and delicate information. So I don't accept pen drives. The only means I will accept is when it is new. In fact, when you are bringing it, no part of it should be open. If I see that, if it is, if you tell me that, oh, you just opened it and the box is even there, I will not accept it. When you buy it, you don't touch it. You have to even give it to me to open myself before I will put it in my machine. So let's move on. All right, so credit card, just like debit cards, you know, all electronic cards, as a matter of fact, are small plastic card used by users to aid payments, to aid, I think we can, to aid, better put it, to aid electronic payments, to aid electronic payments. So whether the card is a credit card or debit card, the definition is the same. The definition is the same because they are all plastic cards. They are used for electronic payments, but then they are not the same in the sense that the way credit cards work differ from the way debit cards also work. So when, in terms of definition, they are all small plastic cards issued to users to aid electronic payments. But in terms of their functions, they are different. So that is the definition we can assign to both debit and credit cards. It's the same definition for both. But credit cards, allow holders or users to buy goods and services now and then the use sorry the issuer that is the one who issued the fine it can be a financial institution it can be any company which is the owner of the credit card or the company which issued the credit card to the holder will make payments for the goods purchased by the holder. And then later on, send the bill at the end of the month, it can be at the end of the month, send the bill to the credit card holder for him or her to settle the amount involved within a stipulated time period. So unlike debit cards, what credit card actually does or how it works is that when the holder purchases, purchases goods and services, then the holder will give this small plastic card to the shop attendant. Now, as soon as the shop attendant swipe it or slot it into the point of sale machine, then 
after the verification, everything is done, then the credit card issuer will settle the merchant, that is the owner or the shop owner, and later take the money from the holder of the credit card. So you, the holder, when you make purchases immediately, it is not your money which is used to settle the bill involved. It is a credit card issuer who will pay the amount involved on the promise that you will repay later when the issuer sends you the credit card bill. So that is credit card. Now, anybody at all can go in for a credit card, of course, just like anybody can go to court, you know? Anybody at all can go in for credit card, but as to whether you get it is a different situation. So if you need a credit card, what you need to do is to go to the credit card issuer. The credit card issuer can be bank or any financial institution. Now, when you go there and you request for the credit card, what a credit card issuer will do is to assess you. The credit card issuer will assess you. That is take you through all the processes needed to ensure that you have the capability or you have what we call in Ghana, the affordability to repay back when they pay on your behalf anytime you make purchases. Now, when they take you through the processes and then they realize that, you know, after all the due diligence, they realize that you are credit worthy or you have the affordability, then they will create what we call the revolving account. Now, before I even continue, one thing you should know is that to, uh, I mean, having a credit card does not depend on you having an account that is a bank account with the particular financial institution. To have a credit card, you don't need a deposit account. That's what I mean. Credit card does not depend on a deposit account because it has no relationship with a deposit account. So when the financial institution realizes that you fit the criteria for them to give you the credit card, they will create what we call the revolving account. The re this revolving account I'm talking about is not a deposit account. The revolving account is an account they create so that they will grant a line of credit. Now, the line of credit represents the amount that they will allow you to spend on their accounts during the month. And then at the end of the month, they will send you the bill for you to settle. Now, the line of credit also greatly depends on your income level at the end of the month. So how much salary you receive will determine or how much income you make at the end of every month will determine the, the credit line that the credit card issuer will grant to you. That is the holder or the uh, person who has requested for the credit card. For instance, no, before I even come to the example, you know that in Ghana, when financial institutions grant loan, per Bank of Ghana's regulation, they are not supposed to grant a loan which will take more than 40% of the empl employee's monthly income. So employees are limited by 40% of their income, of their monthly income. That is how much loan installment they can pay every month, which means financial institutions are not supposed to grant uh, uh, people more than 
40 percent uh, grant them a loan which will take more than 40 percent of their monthly income so for instance if your monthly income is thousand ghana cities and you go you request for a loan or a credit card the financial institution cannot give you an amount which will you know require you to pay more than 400 ghana cities every month because you are limited to pay up to 400 ghana cities every month 400 ghana cities represents 10 40 uh, percent of your monthly in uh, your the thousand monthly income you receive now it's the same thing for credit card you know when you are going in for a loan or if a financial institution advances a loan to you if a financial institution advances a loan to you then you will have to pay back at a later date credit card too requires the same thing if a financial institution advances you or gives you a credit card you use a credit card to make to spend or make purchases and they will pay on your behalf and later send you the bill for you to settle the amount involved so that is why when you are going in for a credit card they take you through the same process as they would if you were to come for a loan now we will just go through some small history of credit card when it comes to credit card the concept was first used as history has it the concept was first used by one man called Edward Bellamy. This man was an author of many award-winning books in the 1800s. In the year 1887, he wrote a book titled Looking Back, Looking Backward, sorry, Looking Backward. In this book, Edward Bellamy made mention of the term credit card 11 times. He made mention of the term credit card 11 times in this utopian novel he wrote in 1887. So he is credited with the use of credit card or uh, he's, he is known to be the first person to have used the term credit card. And even as at that time in his novel, he imagined a world where people can have this sort of card he described and which could enable them to spend and make payments later. So Edward Bellamy is credited with the use of the term credit card 11 times in his utopian novel called Looking Backwards. Now, Modern credit cards that we have came about as a result of a lot of merchant schemes back, I mean, in, in, in the early, so long ago, when there was, you know, nothing like credit card, what merchants were doing was that they, 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 they had their own scheme of advancing credit or selling items on credit to their most loyal customers. So for instance, if someone purchased an item on credit, some merchants kept notebooks or uh, jotters, et cetera, where they recorded the amount bought and the time payment is expected. There were a lot of I mean, merchant schemes, credit schemes they were using. And it is from these schemes that we had modern credit card born. Now, in terms of um, the first use of credit card in the United States, it is recorded that credit card was first introduced around the 1920s around the 1920s in the United States. And 
in the early 1920s, when credit cards started being used, it was mainly used, and remember that uh, in those days, um, the companies which were using credit card, they had the various ways they referred to these credit cards. Now, in the early 1920s, filling stations or fuel stations were, you know, using credit cards or issuing credit cards to their most loyal clients to buy fuel on credit and then later make the payment. Now, in those days, fuel stations accepted only their credit cards. There was nothing like, for instance, Goyle accepting Shell's credit card. Goyle, for instance, accept, accepted only Goyle's credit card. Shell also, for instance, accepted only Shell's credit card. So in the US, in the early 1920s, credit cards were used by various fuel stations to sell fuel to their most loyal customers on credit. Then in 1930s, several companies also started using credit card. That is around the 1930s, a lot of companies also introduced the use of credit card. And in 1938, or by 1938, these companies which were into credit cards started accepting each other's credit card. So not only was one company, or not only was a particular company accepting only its cards, but they were also accepting other companies' credit cards. So, this is how credit cards started gaining grounds. That is right from the 1930s. Each company started accepting each other's cards. One of the first companies to have used or to have begun using credit card was Western Union. And around 1921, they started issuing what they called charge cards. These charge cards were credit cards. They started using charge cards to their most loyal customers. And the charge cards were mainly, you know, paper card stocks that they printed some, I mean, they made some, um, they printed some important information on, on the card stock. So it was like, you know, they had this paper card that they, printed relevant information, like maybe the name of the holder, the institutions, uh, the particular institution, which happens to be the owner of the card, et cetera, et cetera. So they printed some of this information on a card, that is a paper card, and these were issued to their customers as credit cards. Now, along the way, they realized that these printings or these paper stock card, they were, easily being counterfeited. People were just counterfeiting the um, paper stock card that they decided to look for better means of, you know, making credit card difficult to counterfeit. Now, around the same time, charge plates was also developed. Now, you know the Western Union's, um, sorry, I'm coming. Western Union's charge cards, they were very small in nature. So around the 1928, right through 1930s, even up to 1950s, there was this, card called charger plates and it was uh, basically the trademark of farrington manufacturing company farrington manufacturing company and this um 
have to be admitting your colleagues. That's why I, 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 I have been breaking hearing in this. So, charger plates was also developed. And charger plates, they were, you know, cuts, you know, which were used by companies to aid or fast track their back office operation. In the sense that when customers bought items on credit, these charger plates were like, you know, the UPSA student's hospital card. Whenever you go to the clinic, they, uh, you, you pick your card, they do some writings on the card. That card they've been doing the writing on. The charger plate was similar to that. It looked something like that. So they had these cards for all their most loyal clients. Whenever they came to make purchases on credit, they recorded the amount bought, the amount involved, et cetera, et cetera. And then the date for repayment or the date for payment, et cetera. Now, this helped them to ease back office operations because they were able to arrange these cards in such a way that it made them easily retrievable. Now, in 1936, American Airlines and Air Transport Association decided to bring some advancement in the credit card you know, industry. Now, they introduced what they call the air travel card. And the air travel card, they brought it in to help people who wanted to travel now but they didn't have the means of purchasing tickets to be able to buy a ticket now and travel so that they pay later for the amount involved. So all the holders of this air travel card could purchase ticket on credit or could travel on credit and make payments later. Now, one thing that they also added to their air travel card which helped lead a lot of people to, you know, uh, going in for this particular card was the discounts that they also offered. The card offered some 15% discount to all the holders of the card. So that if you use the card to purchase ticket on credit, not only were you buying ticket on credit, but you were also enjoying some reduction of the ticket um, cost, 15% reduction. So the air travel card offered 15% discount to all the holders of the card. Then in 1958, American Express created a worldwide credit card network because all this while, that was right from the 1920s till the 1950s, there was nothing like worldwide credit card network. So holders of credit card could not use them when they traveled outside the US. So American Express decided it was time in 1958, to create a worldwide credit network. And after they created the worldwide credit network, Bank of America, in September 1958, launched the Bank America in California. The Bank America, this credit card allowed or could be used in US and even outside US. So the holders of this particular card could use or make payments whether they were in the US or outside the US. And this really brought a lot of convenience to the holders. Because of this, Bank of America was able to capture the credit card market to the extent that they became the leaders in US. Their card offered a lot of benefits. So people subscribed to their card and they were using it 
And so Bank America enjoyed a lot of, you know, um, sort of monopoly, not monopoly entirely because there were other, you know, uh, companies in the market, but they were the leaders in the credit card industry. Now, after operating for some time, okay, Okay, before I even move on, before I go into the competitor, Bank America became, you know, after they were successful, they enjoyed a lot of, you know, um, a, a lot of, um, you know, a lot of people subscribed to their cards. So they, they had a lot of benefits. They were the leaders of the market. And then eventually, this Bank America evolved into what we have today as a visa system, the visa system. So the Bank America, which was introduced in 1958, worked so hard through the years and eventually evolved into the visa system. Now, Bank of America with their Bank America enjoyed so much so that some group of California banks decided to break their monopoly or decided to give them, you know, some level of competition which will make them not still maintain their leadership role they assumed in the market. So in 1966, the ancestor of MasterCard that we know today was born. And this MasterCard was born as a result of, like I said before, some group of Californian banks coming together to establish what they called at that time, Master Charge, Master Charge. The main purpose for establishing Master Charge was for Master Charge to compete with Bank America keenly to break the monopoly they were enjoying. That was the main purpose. But then, when Master Charge came into the market, they realized that it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy to overtake Bank of America with their Bank America because Bank America had practically taken over the market. So they then decided that they needed more hands, more forces to be able to break them the monopoly of Bank America. So in the year 1969, Master Charge decided to merge with Citibank's everything card that they had launched in 1967. So they merged with Citibank's Master Charge, sorry, uh, everything card, to become one because that card too was performing well in the market. So they merged with them so that they could have a greater front to be able to compete with Bank of America or Bank America. After they joined forces, they were able to give them, you know, um, they were able to match them boot for boot. So or this master charge also evolved into through the years to become what we call the master card today. The master card today. All this while, other countries were also having their own experiences when it came to a credit card. In the UK, Barclays Bank is noted to have introduced the first credit card to be used outside the United States in the year 1966. And this card they called Barclay card, Barclay card. This Barclay card was a credit card or was the first credit card to be used outside the United States. And it's, it's really received a lot of, you know, um, a lot of, 
sorry, you have to be admitting, sorry. I have to be admitting your colleagues, so sorry. So as I was saying, Barclay card happens to be the first must, uh, sorry, uh, credit card to be used outside the US. That is specifically to be used in the UK. Now, let's see how it works. Even though I have described a bit of how it works, but let's go into it again and add some more uh, details to it. Now, credit card, like I said before, when someone who is a holder of a credit card makes purchases, the person pays with a credit card. Now, anytime the holder makes purchases and he wants to make payments with a credit card, he hands over his, his or her credit card to the shop attendant. The shop attendant will either swipe it or slot it into the point of sale device. Now, as soon as the card is slotted into the point of sale device, an alert is sent to the credit card issuer. Now, this is called the electronic verification system. Now, the credit card issuer is supposed to verify that, or this is supposed to assure the merchant that there's enough funds on the credit card to be used by the holder. And what I'm talking about takes happens within some few seconds. This is not minutes thing. It, it, within a twinkle of an eye, it, the how much the how much credit the person has in his revolving accounts will appear for him to for the merchant to see if there is enough funds. Now, once this is assured, that is the amount in the revolving account is assured, or the merchant realizes can make up the payment. Sometimes they'll go ahead to do some further verification by asking the holder of, for instance, the expiry date, some sensitive information which the holder is supposed to know, the expiry date, the residence of the holder, et cetera, et cetera. So when you provide this information, then after everything is okay, the merchant will do his deduction, then, the merchant will print a receipt as evidence of the purchase. The holder will sign, normally the merchant prints two receipts. The holder signs on them, and then the holder keeps one, the merchant also keeps one. It is very, very important that both of them keep their copy of the receipt because whenever there's contention on an item board by the holder, the only means to prove that, for instance, your credit, they send you your credit card bill and they indicate that you bought items worth 1,000 Ghana cities on 21st of February, for instance. And you, you also have your receipt. You check, you realize that no, it wasn't 1,000. It was rather 100 Ghana cities you purchased, which means there, may, there might have been an error. So what do you do? To prove that it's 100 Ghana cities worth of items you bought, you go with your receipt to the credit card company. When they see this, they will, you know, rework the thing or deduct the amounts that you are not supposed to pay for you to pay only the amounts due you. So when you keep your receipts, at the end of the month, the credit card issuer will send you the credit card bill. When they send you the credit card bill, normally or ordinarily, the credit card issuer waives the interest on the credit card bill. They waive the interest and give you a grace period within which to settle the amount involved. So for instance, if you spent 900 Ghana cities during the month, they will not charge you interest immediately. They will waive it that, okay, pay within maybe three days time. So it means that if you make payments within three days time, you won't pay any interest on the money. But 
if the three days lapse, then it means that you are going to pay interest. They will charge you interest plus even late fees or penalty for paying late. So that is how it works. Anytime your credit card bill is sent to you and you don't have or you don't approve of any of the transactions, you can, you know, go to the credit card issuer. Once you're able to prove your point, they will deduct how much you are not supposed to pay and make you pay only how much you are supposed to pay. I've talked about all these. All right. Now, um, I've talked about all these. Okay. Okay. Now, I made mention of the fact that normally interest, the credit card issuer waives interest and then make you pay only the amounts you spent. But if you fail to pay within the grace period they give, then they will charge you full interest on how much you spend during the month plus other penalty fees you pay, et cetera. Now, sometimes what happens is that people may, the debts may keep on piling to a point where they realize there's no way they can settle the bill. And the only way out will be to apply to court for bankruptcy. Now, when this situation happens, we call it the snowball effect the snowball effect. We will come to that when we get to the disadvantages. Now let's move on to the types of credit cards. We have several types of credit cards. We'll look at four main types of these. Now, one thing I want you to know is that the types you are going to look at, you won't get a credit card labeled with any of the types. We don't have a particular credit card labeled as this type or that type, that type, no. All credit cards are one. You are able to know the type of the credit card depending on how the credit card works. Depending on how it works. That will help you to determine the type of credit card you are dealing with. So don't think that we have um, credit cards labeled with the types we are going to look at. It is not like that. How they function, I mean, you are able to tell the type from how they function. Let's go through some of the types. The first one we we'll consider is what we call the standard credit cards, standard credit cards. Now, standard credit cards is simply the normal credit card I have just described this evening. That is a small plastic card that when you need, which is in payment that when you need, you have to apply to the credit card issuer. They will take you through all the processes that they are supposed to take you through. And then if you qualify, they will give you, create a revolving account, grant you a line of credit, and then you can start spending from there. At the end of the month, they bring you the bill, you make payment, et cetera, et cetera. You don't require any deposit before you can get a credit card. So credit card in its normal functions or in its normal sense is described as standard credit card, standard credit card. Then, we have reward cards. The reward cards are not different or credit card. We don't have credit card labeled reward cards. Credit card being or credit card becomes a reward card when the holder has for some time been paying his credit card bills on time. And the credit card issuer notices this and decides to reward the holder. Now, the reward may come in various forms. It can be cash, it can be 
discounts, it can be um, hotel stay, it can be whatever, whatever. Just name them. It can be anything at all. So if you make payments on time, the credit card issuer may decide to reward you by giving you some cash items or other items. Or sometimes they can even give you discounts. That is tell you that, okay, because of your loyalty to us, next month, every item you buy, we will give you 10% off. Meaning that when you are spending during the following month, anything you buy, you will pay 90%. The credit card issuer will pay the 10%. So reward can be in various forms. Then we have secured credit cards, secured credit cards. Now with a secured credit card, um, it, it's a bit, hmm, it, it's a bit off the credit card line. The reason I'm saying it's a bit off the credit card line is that before anyone can have access to this type of credit card, then it means that the financial institution will give you a prerequisite before they issue you with a credit card. For instance, the financial institution will tell you that, okay, for us, before we will give you a credit card, we need you to open an account with us and place some amount of money which will be or which will represent like maybe 50 percent of the credit line they will grant you they will tell you that open this account put the 50 percent of the credit line they will grant you there and you won't touch that account that account is a form of security to them so that should you default in paying your credit card bill then they can fall on the money to settle some of the debts. Now, in most cases, if you look at international trade, if you are going to make international payments and maybe you, you want to do it with a credit card, most of these banks to protect themselves may require that you open an account just like, you, just like when they are granting you LCs, letters of credit. If you do international trade, you go into details uh, on LC. In practical sense, what the banks do is that they will tell you to create an account, put half or so of the money that they are supposed to guarantee into an account before they will give you the letter of credit. Else they won't. So secured credit card works like that. If you are going to make an international payment and you need a credit card, they may request that you open an account, put maybe half of the money into the account, and they'll give you the credit card to use it to make full payment of your goods. And later, when you come and pay for the credit card bill, then you can have the money in the account you created. So that's a secured credit card. This one is not, it is not, uh, you know, uh, popular or, it is not something that people go in for. This is normally used in international trade. Then we have specialty credit cards, specialty. Now with a specialty credit card, this one is normally, um, this is normally, you know, offered to groups or association or clubs or, um, some form of people who are into some partnership or affiliation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. For this type of credit cards, what happens is that a group or an association can approach a financial institution and request for the financial institution to, you know, provide every member of the group with a credit card. Of course, they will send details of the members. The financial institution will do the assessment to know the amount of credit line to grant each member of the group. Now, when, the when they have granted the credit line, 
Then uh, the agreement between the association and the financial institution, at the end of every month, the bank will deduct an amount which represents the dues of the association and pay it into the association's account. So they will deduct the amount of dues from members' credit line and pay it into the association's coffers or account. So for instance, if we have a group called Banking and Finance Evening, Evening Group Association, you can enter into an agreement with Access Bank to issue every member of the group the credit card. But the main purpose for this is for the association to be able to at least get its fees or dues on time. So uh, Access Bank will assess all the people involved in the association and then know how much credit line each member is entitled to. Then at the end of the month, Access Bank will deduct, let's say if the dues is 50 Ghana students, will deduct 50 Ghana students from every member's credit line and pay it into the, the association's account. So that is how the specialty credit cards work. So we have looked at the four types of credit cards. Now let's move on to the benefits of credit cards to the customer. Credit card offers numerous benefits, but the most notable one, or the first one that comes to mind when we talk about benefits of credit cards to the customer is convenience. The use of credit card makes life very easy for customers. How convenient can it be that when you go for shopping, you don't have to use physical cash to make payments. I mean, you don't have to worry about getting money, going to borrow from someone before you can shop. You can sit in your home, buy online, make payments with your credit card. So credit card usage is so convenient to the customer. If we compare credit card and debit card, sorry, uh, credit card, if we compare credit card to debit cards and check, then we see that credit card actually allows for a small short-term loan. You see, with credit card, anytime you spend, it is the issuer who is paying on your behalf. The amount that the issuer is paying on your behalf is just like the issuer granting you a, a short-term loan or some quick loan. So it allows for a short-term loans to be granted. Then credit card also provide more fraud protection than debit cards. Because with credit card, anytime you use it, the verification involved is quite tighter than that of debit card. So it offers more fraud protection. Even in the UK, when you use your credit card to buy items worth over 100 pounds and the items prove to be defective, the bank and the merchant will be the ones who will bear the cost and not the customer. So the bank and the merchant will bear the cost. You, the customer, you will not pay for the defective products. Credit cards also come with a lot of reward and benefit packages. When you pay your credit card on time, the company at a point or the issuer at a point may grant you some cash prizes, holiday uh, opportunities, etc., etc. And this really helps customers a lot. The advantages or benefits, they are a lot. You can read more from the notes and other sources. Now, what about the detriments or the disadvantages to customers? Credit card usage can, you know, it can bring about the customer incurring more debts or yeah, more debt. I think that's more appropriate. 
You know, when you use credit card and the bill is sent to you and you are not able to pay, the credit card issuer will start charging you full interest plus penalty, et cetera, et cetera. And even usually their rates they charge is not something that is fixed. They can change the rates at any time in between six, every six and 12 months, the rate can be changing, going higher and higher and higher. And this can be very disturbing. So if care is not taken, credit card may end up piling a lot of debts on the holder. And the debt, if care is not taken, may get to a point where the holder will not be able to make up the debt. The only way out will be to file for bankruptcy. And when you file for bankruptcy, you know your debt will be forgiven, but it will also mean that you can never have access to a credit facility again. And this, when it happens, we refer to that as the snowball effect. The snowball effect. The snowball effect is simply the situation whereby the credit card issuer is unable to settle his credit card debts. So it keeps on piling up. It gets to a point where there is no way this issuer will be able to settle the debt. The only way out will be to go to court and file for bankruptcy. And this can be very, very disturbing. Also, credit card can bring about inflated prices or merchants, you know, merchants. Merchants may end up inflating their prices as a result of the fact that, you know, merchants pay what we call discounts and interchange fees to their credit card issuers. The notion behind the payment of these fees is that the credit card issuers claim that they have made it easier for the merchants to get their money early and on time. Had it not been for them, like if people purchase on credit, they will have to be chasing after them here and there with all the troubles they'll go through. So if now they are making their work very easy by giving them immediate payment, then they, will ha they have to also settle them something. That's the notion behind the interchange and then the discount fees. So every purchases that the merchant or every sales that the merchant makes, that he is supposed to pay a, a, a particular percentage in, in the form of interchange fees or discount fees to the credit card issuer. And this fees they pay, they are not supposed to pass it on to the ordinary consumer. But what they do is they end up passing it on to the ordinary consumer. So for instance, if they know that they will pay 20 Ghana cities on every 100 Ghana cities worth of items sold, then they will price the items 120 Ghana cities. They won't price it at 10 cities so that they will lose. They will do it. They won't price it at 100 cities so that they will lose. They will do it, they'll price it at 120 cities. And this can be very, very disturbing because inflated prices, even those who are not using credit card will end up also paying for the inflated price. Credit card usage can also weaken self-regulation. If you use credit card, research has shown that you don't feel the pain with or the pain of the pain of payments, you don't feel it that much when you use credit card because you are not parting with physical money. You spend, somebody makes the payment and then later you pay the person. When you are not parting with physical money immediately, you don't feel the pain of shop of making payment. So you may end up spending and spending and spending, which may end up weakening your self-regulation. If you watch the movie of the Confessions of the Shopaholic, you'll see this 
situation well, well illustrated there. Research has also shown that people who use credit card may end up consuming unhealthy foods. Unhealthy foods. If you have credit card, you may feel lazy cooking because you know that you can go to any restaurant of your choice, order food and pay with your credit card. So people may end up consuming unhealthy foods which can, which also come with its own consequences. So these are some of the disadvantages of credit card to the customer. Now benefits to the merchants. Of course, merchants benefit a lot. Had it not been for credit cards, like if merchants sell, sells, sorry, like if merchants sell on credit, they were going to chase after the people who have bought on credit for so long before they realized their money. But now with credit card, merchants don't have to, you know, worry about when people are going to settle their debts, blah, 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 because as soon as they sell, they are paid. So that is very, very advantageous to the merchants. Of course, there's cost to the merchant. This is a disadvantage, cost to the merchant. You remember they pay discounts and interchange, interchange fees to the credit card issuer. This can be very, very disadvantageous. Normally the commission they pay to them is between one to 3% of every item they sell and the payment is made by credit card. They have to pay one, between one and three discount, percent discount to the credit card uh, issuer. Credit card has its own security problems. Now you know that people still, other people's credit cards, they use it to shop online. They do all sorts of things with credit cards online. So credit card is, is very, 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 you know, um, um, it is good. But, but then if care is not taken and it lands in the wrong hands, it can really cost the holder of the credit card. So it is very important that we take good care of our credit card, not only our credit card, all our cards. We take very good care of them. We don't leave them just at any place. And even when we lose them, we have to immediately inform the issuer for them to block and provide us with another credit card. Credit cards can be used in the ATM. You remember last week I told you that there is fast loan. That is one of the functions of the ATM is fast loan. Now, what credit card actually does is that when an when a holder knows that he or she has funds or credit line in his revolving account, and that maybe he is in need of an immediate cash for payments, he can talk to the credit card issuer that he, they should allow for him to redraw part of his credit uh, line and use it for physical payments. If the issuer, <clears throat> sorry, if the issuer allows, then the credit card holder can go to the ATM, slot in the card and make the withdrawal. And this is possible. So he can withdraw parts of his credit line through the ATM. Now, electronic card numbering. Electronic card numbering. If you have your card closer to you, you look on it, you see that there are lots of information on the card, but the numbers and the information found on every card depends on the format that it, it takes and everything depends on the type of issuer or the particular institution that issued it. But generally, if you take for instance, MasterCard and Visa, 
the card, uh, the number, the card number, the first, the first six, the first six numbers on the card normally represents what we call the bank identification number. The first six digits is normally what we call the bank identification number. It helps to determine who's, which bank's card the particular card is. So that's the first six digits. Then the next nine digits, you know, normally the, for Visa card and MasterCard, the numbers are 16. So the first six is bank identification number. The next six, normally they use part of your bank account. They use part of your bank account, uh, bank account number. They, they take part of it and then add it to the bank's prefix. Then the last digit, which makes it 16, is called the validity check code. Validity check code. So this is the numbering on credit card. In addition to the credit card numbers, uh, or debit card. I mean, this one goes for all the cards. What's the meaning of KMFD? From Oman to everyone, KMFD. What does it mean? Yeah, it's a mistake. I, mean, I don't know if it was a big. Pardon? Hello? But I was, I'm saying that he mistake. has. Oh, okay. All oh, right. Okay. okay, no problem. I thought maybe it was a shortened message. Shorthand. Okay, so aside the card number, there are other information too, like the issuer's name, the expiry dates, and other important security codes, etc. Especially if you pick a debit card. I don't know if you have your debit cards by you. If you have your debit cards by you, please go to the back. Turn to the turn the card away from the front side with your card number. Just turn the card, look at the back of the card. You will see some three numbers. So, uh, mo most of the banks they use three. Some in before some banks were using five, but mo mostly it is three. Please, who has his or her card with him or her? Have you seen the three, num three numbers I'm referring to? Oh, it means nobody has his or her card. No, right. you don't, I'm not sure they have. Me, my okay. don't have the card. All right, don't worry. When you no, please. No, I'm happy. you have yours, turn to the back, turn the card. Yes. Turn the card, look yes. at the back page. Do you see some three numbers? Yes, please. Uh huh. That is very, very important. That is a security code, eh? Yes. You know the function, yes. they call it, uh, you know normally when you are making payments online with especially your debit card, especially your debit card. After you've provided that's all that's the information, they will request for some CVV. CVV, it is normally CVV code. CVV code. Whenever they request for that information, the three numbers you see at the back is what you key there or what you type there for the CVV. 
Now, without this code, you cannot make online payments. When you're making online payments, you don't put, put your PIN number for the CVV. It won't pick. The CVV is a security code at the back of your card, the three digits code. And that is what you put there to activate your purchase. Now, if you take a debit card, eh, your example, your ATM card, once it gets stolen, inform your bank immediately because if somebody lines his or her hands on your card, the person can use it to shop against you. Don't think that the, the person does not have your, your PIN number. With online payment, the person does not need your PIN number. All the person needs is the card. Because every information the person requires is on the card, including the security code, the CVV, is at the back. So please be careful with your card. All right. So that is it for the things you see on electronic cards. Now we move on to debit cards, debit cards. Now debit card, the definition too is the same, like I told you, whether debit card or credit card, they are all small plastic cards which are issued to aid electronic payments. But then debit card differs from credit card in the sense that Unlike credit card that you don't require a bank account before you can have, you don't require a bank account to have access to it. With debit card, you need a deposit account. Debit card is issued on a deposit account. It is issued on a, deb a deposit account because debit card is spent or you make payments, if you are using debit card, you make payment directly from your deposit account, which means if you don't have money in your deposit account, you cannot, you cannot use debit card. So for debit card, how much you have in your bank account will determine how much you can spend. Unlike credit card where you can spend uh, or, and then somebody is making payment. Of course, that one too depends on your line of credit. But you don't require any deposit account to have a credit card, but you require deposit account to have a debit card. Now we have um, we have types of debit cards, and when it comes to debit card, just like the credit card, you know, every country or every bank or financial institution and how they may customize a particular debit or credit card to suit the function or what they want the card to do. So even though we may have a particular card, that's a debit card, but then a particular financial institution may have given a name to it. So they name it to suit their banking operations. Now, there are types of debit cards. We have three main types that we are going to look at. We have the first one, online debit system, online debit system. This one too, just like I made mention for credit cards, do not think that we have a debit card labeled online debit card and a debit card labeled offline credit card, sorry, debit card, and a debit card labeled electronic purse. There's nothing like that. You are able to determine the type of debit card you are dealing with and the function of the card. So if a card is an online debit card, then it means that as soon as the holder makes payments with the card, there is an immediate reflection of the amount spent 
on the account, on the deposit account of the holder. So if you spend, for instance, 100 Ghana cities, you use your card to make payment of 100 Ghana cities. As soon as you make the payment, there will be an alert on your phone that you spent 100,000 from your account. That is online. It doesn't take second. As soon as it is done, it reflects immediately. Then we have the offline. You know, the ATM card is an example of on an online um, debit card. Because as soon as you use your ATM to withdraw money from the machine, you get alerts. So it's an example of an online. Then we have the offline. For the offline, what happens is that when you use the card to make payments, there is not an immediate reflection of the payments on your account. Normally, it can take two to three days before there will be a reflection of the payments you made on your account. So for all offline debit card system, when payments are made by the holders, it takes two to three days for a reflection of the payment to be on their accounts. That is offline. It is not an immediate, or there is not an immediate reflection. It takes two to three days. But online, there is an immediate reflection on the accounts of the holder. Then we have electronic persistence. With the electronic pay system, these are the type of debit cards which requires the holder to load money, load money onto the card before he or she can use it. With the electronic pay system, you need as a holder to load money onto them before you can use it for payment. Example of an electronic purse is the Easewish card, the Easewish card in Ghana. You load money onto it, then you can shop with a card. The advantages of debit cards, of course. The first advantage we can think of is the fact that it enables people who are not credit worthy to also have access to an electronic card. Ordinarily, someone who has filed for bankruptcy and all his credit card debts have been given, have been, you know, forgiven him or her, such a person may not be able to have access to a credit card again. But with debit cards, they can have access to them because debit card goes with a deposit account. It does not require someone to make payments when you spend. You spend directly from your bank account. Then debit cards, you know, that involves less identification and scrutiny. So it can be, the usage can be very fast and convenient as well. But this can also be disadvantageous because when you are spending, when ver the verification is less, then it means that there's more chance for people to also steal other people's um, funds in their accounts. So um, you can read more. There are a lot more disadvantages you can read. When you, uh, when you get the advantages and disadvantages, when you get your nose. Okay, now we move on to new developments in electronic cards, new developments. Now, one of the new developments that have occurred in the electronic cards industry is the fact that now companies are introducing or they are bringing into the market what we call the new biometric credit card technology. New biometric credit card technology. 
Now, this new biometric credit card technology is, you know, a card that they have um, introduced, which is activated by the fingerprints of the holder, the fingerprints of the holder. So it can, it can even be, it is not only for credit card anyway, both debits and credit cards. You, your fingerprint has been programmed on the card. So once you slot in your fingerprint, you can use it to unlock the card. Or you can, you, you can lock the card and unlock only with your fingerprint. In Ghana, we, we, we don't have it yet. But in the advanced countries, they are really rolling out this biometric. There's also one um, credit card that they have introduced, which also is computerized in the sense that it has a, 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 a processor in it. So the customer can actually lock the card. When you lock it, every information is erased. When somebody has fixed your credit card, it will be useless because there won't be anything on it. When you unlock it, all your information will come back. This is also another development they have brought into the credit card and debit card industry. Now, EaseWish is an example of an electronic purse type of debit card. EaseWish was introduced in Ghana way back in 2008. The main purpose of introducing this card was to enable electronic payment in the country. But this card was not received, well received. And I blame that on the publicity. There wasn't enough publicity. People did not really get the understanding. People thought that it was going to be like uh, you know, the fact that they should put their money somewhere and somebody can run away with their money because other people, you know, <clears throat> sorry, you know, some people, they don't trust or they, they, won't, they say they won't put their money in the bank because they feel that when you put your money there and tomorrow they collapse, you are in trouble. So and there were a whole lot of misconception and all that here and there, which led to the card not being accepted. But it was a very good idea, which if we had received it very well, it would have worked really, really well for us. But then um, now you don't even hear of it. Some years ago, the government was, wanted to force it on public workers. But then after the uh, union groups threatened a strike, they decided to let go. So you can read more on EaseWish also because it happens to be the only smart card or the only technology that actually allows all banks to operate on a common platform. What I mean by this is that with the EaseWish card, you can walk to any bank at all to have access to your bank accounts. You can walk to any bank at all now there are even ATMs which accept EaseWish card. So it was a good, you know, uh, innovation, just that it wasn't well received by Ghanaians. Okay, so we'll end the lecture here. I have some videos that I've placed on the LMS. When you go there, you can watch them. The reason why I didn't show videos here is, um, you know, I normally post my lecture videos on YouTube. And when you are posting and you have other people's videos in it, you have copyright issues. So the videos have been uploaded on the LMS. You can go there and watch. Or you can even get some of the videos from YouTube. When you get the lecture slides, you can get the videos from YouTube then you watch. So um, Gabriel, what I want you to do is that I want you to have the class divided into 
you are 20. So let's have four groups. Four groups. Let's have four groups. Then I will give you assignments for the term. You present it uh, on our last meeting. As part of every group's assignments that I'll give, this question is a bonus question to all the groups. I mean, it, it is going to be scoring all right, but then every group will do it. Each group will choose a bank and then present their digital banking technologies. I mean, it will be part of your assignment. So meaning you are having two main assignments for the term paper. This is one of them. I'll give you the other one um, by next week. So Gabriel, please get, do the grouping. Let me have the grouping before the weekend. And then I'll assign the um, various topics you work on for your term paper. I may decide to even... I may decide to even make the term paper 25 and maybe the miss them 15. Uh, that one depends on me. So you let's see what happens. When I get the list, then you will we'll see, you we'll know what to do. But from next week, we'll be meeting face to face. Um, evening lectures, I don't like. I don't like evening lectures. Because I live very far. I'll be coming from Kaswa. And I have to close. On the timetable, they've written 8.30. Hey, my people. Me, I can't close 8.30. Because um, my place is far. And I can't drive. Um, they will issue it to each of them members no they'll have and an agreement with the with the bank at that given period the bank will deter yeah the bank will deter that said man from so what i'm asking that is going to load that money on that credit card or is the app like who is going to load money on that credit card for the bank to deter I that uh, is it my volume or reduce for that credit card? Uh, i'm coming in i can't hear you well let me check my volume Uh, my volume is very okay. Please, I beg you, come again, okay? Please ask your question again. I didn't get you well. Hello. Okay. Hello, madam. Aha. Uh -huh. I can hear you now. Please, please, can you hear me now? Yes, please talk. All right, madam. Please, um, what I'm saying, uh, I'm under that uh, when you get to the secure credit card, uh -huh. um, you said that uh, they will issue the credit card to group members or the individual members in the group. And at the end of the month, or well, at that given, but they will deduct uh, a certain amount from credit card either monthly or whatever. So what I'm asking is that, who is going to load that credit? Is it the individual person who are going to load that money into that um, credit card or? No, with credit, with, with credit card, nobody load money onto anything. Credit card is the credit line that the financial institution has granted to the issuer, to the holder, sorry. When you apply for credit card, they assess you based on your affordability, as in based on your salary. They will look at how much you can pay, pay your salary, and then they will use that to grant you a credit line. So for instance, Okay, so Madam, is the individual person going to pay that you, wait, amount? Wait, I'm coming, I will address it. You listen to what I'm saying. So for instance, if your salary is 1,000 Ghana cities, per Bank of Ghana's regulation, the bank can only uh, make you pay a loan installment of every month, which is not more than 400 Ghana cities. So then they will grant you a credit line of 400 Ghana cities, meaning that during the month, you can spend up to 400 Ghana cities and they will pay 
for you. They will pay for you when you spend with the credit card. But this amount should not exceed 400 Ghana cities. Now, at the end of the month, they will send you the bill. So the 400 Ghana cities is your credit line the bank has given you. Now, in terms of the specialty, when the group enters into an agreement with a financial institution that we want you to issue our members with credit cards. And I said that mainly the notion behind that is for the group to be able to get their, their dues from members on time. So for instance, if members are to pay 50 Ghana cities and the group enters and uh, they, they enter into an agreement with a financial institution to grant every member a credit card. The bank will assess every member and grant them a credit line depending on their various salaries. So one member can have 400 Ghana cities depending on his salary. Another member can have 200 Ghana cities depending on his salary. One member can have 5,000 Ghana cities depending on the salary. Then these credit lines that the bank has granted to the members of the group, at the end of every month, they will deduct the 50 cities, for instance, from every member's credit line. That 50 cities they deduct from members' credit line. When they are sending members their credit card bill, the 50 cities is also there. It's, do you understand? So when you pay the bank, how much you have spent the month, uh, during the month out of your credit line, it is included the 50 cities that was deducted for your dues. Do you understand? Oh, all right, madam. Are you sure you are okay? Yeah, I'm okay, madam. Actually, that was, that was under special uh, specialty credit card. So yes. the second, Question was on the secure credit card, and I missed it. So the second one is secure. That um, they have to put a certain amount. The which one did say, you ask? Um, which one did you ask? The first one that I asked should I be a charity credit card, but I I mentioned secure credit card. Ah, okay. So I actually I, I, I wrote the question that you were lecturing so that I can ask them. Okay, so I, I answered I, it, I right? I made this one with the second one. Yeah, you answered it. That, that would be under the specialty credit card. All right, that's good. So ask the second one. Okay, so the second one is under uh, secured credit card. Okay. Okay, madam. So that one, you said um, they, they have to put a certain amount um there before they can use that credit card right yeah before the bank even grants you or issues you with a credit card they'll request that you open an account with them and you deposit you make a deposit of a specified amount then they'll give you the card the deposit account or their uh, the uh, 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 yeah, yeah so i understand that it's a security so my question is mm -hmm. um Okay, madam. So my question is, are they going to um, pay interest the money that you deposit there? Since you are not going to tie them, are they going to pay interest on that money? Oh, that one, that one, it depends on every bank and their policy. But ordinarily, since it is supposed to be a, some sort of security, it shouldn't come with interest. But now as a result of competition, you know banks, Way go overboard. So a particular bank may promise interest on the money. So it depends on the bank and, the, and their policy. Welcome. All right, right madam. So I think I'm, 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 I'm okay now. Oh, okay. We thank God. Any other question? All right, so if there are no more questions, we'll end here. I'll leave you with the quotes. The expert in everything was once a beginner.
I wish you all the best. We'll meet next week face to face, God willing. Enjoy your evening. Oh, all right. All right, madam. So next week. All right. Bye. Okay, bye, madam. <laughs>